Today I have another very exciting dance expert for you. So Erica is someone that I have been in awe of actually on Instagram. She's doing some of the most important work that I've seen like in recent years and I'm so excited for you guys to get to know her if you don't already. Um, so Erica, could you give us a little bit of an intro to you and your work? Sure, thank you for that. I, <laughs> I don't know, that's a uh um very very complimentary I really appreciate that and um I think I just I think of all the people in my field as we'll get into that um are doing this work that people don't know about so uh for me if I can just create a little bit more visibility for all the people that came before me then my work my work has been done so um that being said my name is Erica Hornthal um on social media I tend to go as the go by the therapist who moves you and I'm a board certified dance movement therapist. I'm also a licensed clinical professional counselor uh, in the state of Illinois in the United States, which is where I live just outside of Chicago. And I'm super passionate about not just movement with regard to dance or exercise, but really allowing people to rediscover their mind body connection and how the way they move the patterns of their movement very much has everything to do with who they are how they behave. And if they want to make changes to those things, we have to look at the body. Yeah. So anyone who's been around my channel for a while will know I've gone really deep down this particular rabbit hole over the last, mm -hmm. like, especially year. I've been doing the work for myself for a few years, but more recently, I'm just so excited for voices like yours to be yeah, spread even further and wider and you know it's so lovely because you're so humble to honor the people that came before you but it's also so important that there are people willing to also share the message and not just doing the work behind the scenes so I love that you're doing both in fact the work behind the scenes and also letting people know about this work and that they're invited which is so beautiful I want to know how you got into it, Erica. How did it all start for you? Was it a journey of your own that you then were like, this is the medicine I needed, here it is for other people? Or were you just drawn to this kind of work on a, like an intellectual level? Yeah, people say that a lot. Like it must've been your own personal history, right? Or, or um, I certainly have known colleagues who went to see a dance therapist and because of the work that they did with them, just really fell in love with the work and decided that they too needed to become a dance therapist. Um, for me, it was really just born out of my stubbornness not to let go of dance, but mm. also for me, because I realized what I'm about to say may sound um, interesting to some people. I didn't want to sell myself short of all of the other interests that I had. And that's yes. not to say that dance is not um, everything to some people. I just knew it wasn't for me. Like I didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the technique. I really didn't have the passion with regard to performing or educating. My passion lay lies, I guess, continues to lie in the expression, um, sometimes the escapism, the creativity, the improv. I just, I just love to dance. It just... I feel my mo I feel most myself when I'm dancing. So to get rid of that, but then to also ignore or throw out the window all the other things I was interested in, like science and medicine and what I came to find out later, psychology. You know, I'd always been a helper and I was always the person that people came to to talk about problems. Um, but it wasn't until college that I started to take psychology classes and it just fit. So many things that I was reading about, I was like, wait, this doesn't happen to everybody <laughs> or not everybody, <laughs> not everybody thinks about these things or, you know, these phenomenons that just kind of fit into place. I thought, oh, there's a name for all of it. I want to study this more. And it was my freshman year of college. I was actually on the dance major track and quickly things decided that things changed thanks to the universe and I guess divine intervention. Um, I was informed about the field of dance movement therapy. And so kind of thought it over in like 24 hours, decided to get my degree in psychology. And I couldn't minor in the school that I was at, but I, I was still able to audit and take as many dance major classes as I could to fit into my schedule. So that was 
honestly, the way that I was able to meet I would say both, if not all of my passions. Did I know what dance therapy really was at the time? No. And it's certainly, mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like now I'm starting to really understand for me what my niche is in the field, but it took many years. I mean, I didn't even know what it was when I graduated. It's very much, uh, I guess like psychology is, you you read it, you'll learn from the textbooks, but you don't really know what it is until you start to practice and figure out what your framework is. And the population that you choose to work with. So that was actually a pretty direct path because I found the field, graduated, went on to get my master's in dance movement therapy and counseling. And then, yeah, just pursued a private practice as soon as possible. And that's kind of how I got to where I am today. So um, again, it felt kind of like this uh, fate, destiny kind of stepping in, but was it born out of my own needs with regard to like mental health and body work? Not necessarily. And that's something that now I'm really invested in and really interested in. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think that's why I'm so passionate about kind of spreading the word. Cause it's like, Oh, there's such a huge piece of healing that's missing from the mainstream conversations of mental health and psychology that I think it's worth um, putting it out there. Yeah. And I want to ask you more about that, but I'm really interested in this. So you, you'd started doing a dance degree and mm-hmm. then you made this switch over. Was that process simple for you? Because it was like a like light bulb moment of like, oh yeah, this is the really the thing that calls my heart. Or was there a process of like, um, I'm asking this because for me, there've been many moments along my career where I feel like I failed as a dancer because I was Mm -hmm. neither called to follow that like dance as performance all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, and there were moments where I honestly had to grieve that and I felt like a failure. So I'm wondering, because that was really quite early in your career, what that moment was like for you. I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think as dancers that that is oftentimes the first Mm, the kind of like the go-to response, right? Maybe it's that perfectionistic uh, quality characteristic that so many of us cling with, cling on to. Um, maybe I did at the time, but I, I don't think so. Only because as I kind of like reference my own body, it, it that doesn't sit anywhere for me. Mm. And I think because going into it, I really wasn't connected to being a dance major to begin with. Like I, I think I, I always knew that if I was go, if I was going to be a performer, I guess in in my mind, not that I I still really wanted to go to college, that I wanted that experience for myself, but it almost felt like dancing in college was going to lead me to education, which I, I knew I never wanted. I knew that I was not really built to teach dance or, um, you know, educate on like dance history right at like a collegiate level type thing so I don't think I was entirely connected to that so I think when I heard dance movement therapy it was such a sense of relief and like oh my god I found my purpose because it didn't really fit for me in the dance curriculum right I was getting to the point pretty early on where it was stuff I really wasn't interested in and um you know it was freshman year I think I was able to keep up with a lot of the choreography but as the years went on I'm I'm sure it would have been much more of a challenge I don't think that I would have I think I would have um I don't know how to put it like uh, there was no audition at the beginning kind of get into the program and then you audition I think about six months in I don't think I would have made it past the audition (laughs) so uh, so it was a huge sense of relief I think Mm. I was feeling successful at that point instead of feeling like, oh, I've failed. But I've definitely known that feeling of failure in the dance world. And maybe that's one of the reasons I didn't pursue it. Mm. Um, You know, I think at some point I was like, if I'm, you know, destined to perform, I, I thought, well, you go to New York. I mean, at the time, you know, it was kind of like, you're going to dance on Broadway. And again, one, it wasn't in me enough to be like, yes, that's my destiny. And two, I just, Maybe, maybe it was my way of like avoiding the rejection, you know, That's my stupid. reality, but uh, I can understand why it would be for many Yeah. People. That's so interesting. And it's so, I'm so happy that you, that you had 
this um, feeling of belonging immediately in the other, in that other part of dance, which like, it's so interesting because I feel like, I don't know, it probably depends where people live. It probably depends on their experience of dance, but that they're very, very boxed off. That's what mm. I feel like sometimes. And I love dipping into different things. Like I call myself a generalist. I've never really been a specialist in any one thing because I love learning about them all, but then I can never like really <laughs> focus on just one. Cause I'm like, there's so much to learn from all of these. And I see myself more as a bridge builder, but I'm mm. so glad for people like you who are like super specialists in something who have like deep wisdom and knowledge who are also willing to speak to the people that are outside of their box if that makes sense. Because I certainly come across a lot of people who are like, go away, you're not in my box. Like yeah. you're not one of us, so just bye-bye. You don't know anything about this. And I really appreciate your work in that way because you're, you're also so encouraging for people. And we will get into the, the body stuff, but I wanted to just no, hear this is your great. thoughts it's such about a needed, that. It's such a needed conversation. <laughs> I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. And particularly in this um, piece about, mental health for example mm. because I also felt like there was a box around psychology like I did this almost the same as you but from the other way around so I did a dance degree and then I did um electives in psychology and mm. evolutionary psychology <laughs> so I was doing it kind of from the opposite side um but I always felt like people were like oh she's just a dancer like like why is mm. she even here kind of thing <laughs> so I love that you yeah you're like also a bridge in so many ways so what's missing from the the pure psychology conversation if we could call it that yeah well I mean I actually want to just say I, I really appreciate a lot of the things that you just said and that I've even come up against that in the field that I'm currently in right that there was for the longest time this box and you were kind of expected, depending on where you went to school, to stay in that certain framework or that box, so to speak. And I, I don't. I'm. I think some people would think that I'm, uh, like, what's the word? Um, maybe assertive or aggressive in that sense. Um, I wasn't always that way, but when I really know what I want, um, nothing can really stop me. <laughs> so. It's, it was hard because once I kind of found or started to find my voice and what I really wanted to focus on, even early on, it wasn't always accepted. And it was kind of like, well, that's nice, but that's not how we operate, right? And I guess at some point, I just also recognized that as amazing as I think our field is, it's been left behind um, and sometimes on its own accord. And I wasn't okay with that, especially if I want to have a career, if I want to have longevity, if others, you know, I want others to, to join this career too. So I don't know, it just felt necessary to step out of that box because it, the box wasn't really for me. <laughs> it wasn't really how I was meant to practice. So I think that is ultimately what brought me to your question now, right? Is like what's missing from this mainstream conversation. And while I'm so happy, and maybe more happy, more than happy, like ecstatic to see that body is being talked about, right? Especially with regards to trauma, which definitely applies to a lot of the dance world, right? There's a lot of body trauma, body shame. Um, sadly, there's a lot of abuse in many different ways. I'm so glad that trauma and the body are being talked about. And that's not it. That body really needs to come into every aspect of healing. And so not that it's for me to change, at least on my own, but I think it's time that the field of psychology focuses more on body, not just as an adjunct, not just as, oh, you could specialize in, but that every psychologist, every therapist, every social worker should understand basic nervous system regulation. They should understand that much of who we are and where we originate comes from our bodies. Um, and then, you know, maybe understand that to make changes, it's helpful to use the body. I can understand that not being the way everybody operates. Um, that's that's a somatic thing, a dance therapy thing. Um, I get that. But we're really, th this whole like, well, if you have a problem, talk to someone. It's not enough anymore. It's just, it's just not enough because 
we are very good at talking ourselves out of things. There are enough people in our communities that cannot speak or don't know what to say. And it excludes a lot of people from the conversation around mental health. So if we can be inclusive and go into the body, which everyone has, and movement, which everyone does in some way, shape, or form, I think it normalizes a lot of mental health and potentially destigmatizes a lot of it. Yeah. So can we define dance therapy for those who are new to it? And it doesn't need to be a nice, neat definition. I don't know, maybe you have one, but just so that they can get an idea if they've never experienced dance therapy before of what it is and what it includes. Sure. Well, traditionally dance therapy is a niche psychotherapy that uses movement to integrate social, emotional, physical, cognitive, I would say even spiritual parts of an individual. I tend to go beyond that definition because I think it's it's still a little elusive. It's a little um, confusing for some people. And so what I've settled on recently is that movement therapy, dance movement therapy, or in some places as it's known, dance movement psychotherapy, is really about bringing all of our communication into the therapeutic relationship. So even though it focuses on dance and the word movement, understanding that everything we do is movement, digestion, breathing, talking, gesturing, posturing, panic attacks, depression, anxiety, like all of that has movement to it. And if we don't bring that into the conversation and into the therapeutic relationship or alliance, again, we're leaving a lot on the table. And so that's, to me, in a nutshell, really what dance movement therapy is. I think also what sets it apart is that the dance movement therapist isn't just listening with their ears. They are also using their body as the tool and the instrument to process, to intervene, to assess, and to observe what the client or their clients are are telling them, right? So it's a different way of looking at things, a different way of validating and supporting a client, which I find very powerful, but can also be very overwhelming to clients who have never had that experience, right? If they've never been validated in their words, they can't even imagine what it's like to be validated, in their bodies or it's scary. So it's very delicate work. It's um, you really have to go at the pace of your client. And uh, while it can be very accelerated healing, we also you know, want to be very gentle and compassionate with the process. So what might a session look like? And I'm guessing it widely varies depending on the client. <laughs> but it does. Like I mean, example. Yeah, it, it definitely varies. And, you know, being a, more of a dance audience, you know, I think just putting it in terms of dance, you know, if someone were to ask you, you know, what kind of dance do you do? You know, or what is, what does a dance class look like? Again, there's so many, you know, are we doing ballroom? Are we doing ballet? Is this contemporary? Is this jazz? Is it hip hop? What kind of hip hop? You know, it's like, yeah, there is so much, maybe it's improv, maybe it's authentic movement. So, you know, one, think of it in terms of what does a quote dance class look like? But then also think of it in terms of if you were to go to a doctor, right? And you ask the doctor, what's it going to look like when I meet with you, right? There are some strategies, right? There's some like, I'm going to take your vitals. We're going to talk about your health. Um, I'll check you out. I'll assess you. But um, but again, it's like, what are we going to talk about? What's going to come up? Well, it's dependent on the person that you're in the room with, right? So I encourage people to kind of take what they know about dance and movement out the window and really focus on more about that mental health therapy piece. So when I meet with a client, it's really asking them like, why are you here, right? In in a positive manner, right? What are you looking to accomplish? What are the goals that you have for yourself? What are you struggling with? And do you have any experience with therapy? You know, because a lot of people that come to me have been in talk therapy for many, many years and they've reached a plateau. And they know that something is missing with regard to really listening. And so now it's time to really, you know, tune into the body. Um, And so that can look a lot of different ways, right? It can be, you know, someone comes in and is already very in touch with their body and just wants to move authentically to music or without. Um, Oftentimes it's a client coming in and sitting down, you know, and just looking to the naked eye, like a regular traditional psychotherapy session But the difference is, again, I'm really listening with my body. I'm 
asking them to tune into theirs. And if and when we reach a plateau or we've run out of things to say, that's when we can rely on movement, right? We can say, well, this is what we've talked about. Would you like to embody that, you know, or what might this look like through movement? There's so many different things to explore. I think that's one of the things that drew me to it is like every session is different and new. And for someone that doesn't really do well with mundane and like same thing over and over and over again, it's very exciting. It's like always something different to uncover, even with the same person. Um, that's my perspective. That's how I practice. But depending on the dance therapist you're talking to, some of them have very regimented, like this is what I do every single time. Um, others are going to be more dance focused. And some of them actually are much more talk therapy oriented and then just kind of use the somatics for nervous system regulation and or, um, you know, basic awareness. That is so interesting. And I, on a personal level, totally resonate with the with the flexibility and the adaptability of like depending on who's right there in front of you and it's mm. almost so healing to have someone there reacting to what you need rather than like I know what you need beforehand come in and I'll give it to you <laughs> like even that in itself is such a beautiful thing yeah yeah well I think it's also what I appreciate in therapy like I, I see my own therapist and she actually happens to be a dance therapist but again the movement we do is very much just like what did you notice? How does that feel in your body? I mean, I sit on a sofa. I sit very comfortably on her sofa. Um, she, her dog is there. So like where <laughs> I'm like rubbing, petting her dog all the time. I mean, it's, it's not probably what people think of with regard to dance or movement, but it's also about the dance or movement that you need, you know, the dance or movement that pertains to your healing and your growth. And again, going back to my roots as a dancer, it was always to kind of be get beyond myself, right? Or put on a persona. So it my natural form of expression isn't really to like put on some music and like dance out my problem. It's much more micro movement. It's much more internalized. And being able to connect mind and body in that way is still very challenging for me. So yeah. So for people who maybe think they've listened to it up till now and they're like, okay, like that's interesting, but they're thinking, but what, what am I going to find in my body that I don't already know in my brain, for example? Mm. <laughs> what could you share with those people that they might not yet be aware of in terms of what resides in our body or what we can connect to? Yeah, that's a really great question because I think a lot of people think that like, you know, okay, sounds great. And, um, you know, one of the things I like to point out is, and I get some pushback, not from my own community, but I do get a lot of pushback from, you know, more traditionally educated mental health practitioners, right? That everything starts in the body. Like I firmly believe, I remember in my book, I put, I, I ended up having to put that I hypothesize because it was like, well, we can't really prove it. Or, you know, you haven't done the research. Other people have, like it's out there. But I firmly believe that movement comes first and then the mind, right? We're not, at least if we have some sense of a mind, we can't tell people because we don't have the capacity to reflect. And I think a lot of that is mind, that ability to be self-aware or to reflect on what we're thinking. Um, we can't do that as infants, right? It's all impulse. It's all reflexes. And those parts of our brain aren't even really developed yet. So again, not focusing on the fact that it's like dance. Well, dance comes first and then the mind. No, no, because by the time we can dance, whatever that means for people, we're like two, three. And what I'm talking about happens actually before that. So this idea that we have to change our mindset, right? To change our habits or patterns. Habits and patterns are actually wired through our bodies. They're wired through early experiences, like how we connect to our caregivers, right? Um, how we reach for an object, how we learn to sit up or to stand or eventually walk. I'm not talking about developmental milestones. Those are different. Those are, you know, sitting up, walking. I'm talking about the connectivities, the way our bodies are patterned, right? The way our muscles are patterned, our movement is ultimately what, becomes identity and self or lack of. And so when we're sitting with these really big what ifs or, you know, 
I don't want to feel this way. Maybe I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to change my habits. Mindset is like the hardest way to do it <laughs> because you're working with something that was developed years into your life or process as opposed to going back to the origins, you know, going back to how we started. Um, and it sounds, I think when I say it that way, it sounds overwhelming, but what I think people don't get is that it's very small movements, you know, it's micro movements, um, and small movements lead to big changes that has been, that has been proven over and over again. So, yeah, I think that for me is it understanding that, you know, movement kind of trumps all, um, in a sense and mind develops from the way we move it does it go back and forth, right? The way I think does impact how I move. But before we can think, literally, right? We're too young to think. We have all these years, maybe two or three years of movement under our belt that we can go back and repattern. And when we do that, we end up thinking very differently. Um, and, you know, so for trauma, as an example, we're not just looking at changing the mindset and using the body to cope, but we can actually challenge the way we move because when we do endure trauma it ultimately changes our movement yeah it's so powerful and I remember um reading one of your posts and also putting underneath the fact that you know if you just go back in e the evolutionary tree like there are creatures that moved but didn't have a brain so it's obvious that movement precedes thought if you look right. at it from like the holistic perspective and I love that you also use that just the human from being born or even before that, I mean, there's movement in the womb, right? So, right, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you could go back and say like, there's movement before, you know, like egg yeah. has to try, like sperm has to travel to egg, right? So right. like everything is movement. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I just did like a Parkinson's support group last week. And I always ask people like, how are you moving? What kinds of movement are there? And I love it. She said vascular. I was like, yes, mm. yes, that is movement. There's vascular yeah movement happening. So yes, to answer your, or just to add to that conversation, right. is like, yeah, there's fetal movement, right. But what about the movement to create, <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the embryo. So yeah. It's so true. And it's, I, I don't know, we take all this movement. I mean, even right now we're both moving so much the internal movement and then the micro movements on the outside, even though we're both sitting down. Um, but I think even on the macro, like dancers, if you're listening to this, if you just think about, you know, how you feel when you go and stand at the bar and that moment where you come into your ballet posture and just noticing that that is not just something that you're doing, but you somehow feel hmm. slightly differently or there's a different aspect of yourself that you can connect to in those moments. Hmm. Um, and, it, you know, we sometimes take it for granted. And some people might think about that as like, oh, it's the, I'm performing as something else. but you really, if you think about it and you are embodied, then you're also feeling it. Although having said that, I just know that there are many, many dancers who are, I don't know if the word is disembodied. That's the word that I use for like previous moments of my previous self um, yeah. because of, I mean, so many reasons, the, the pain that's kind of required through some of it, well, required in quotes, through some of the training <laughs> and not wanting really to feel it and to push through and all these other things. And I mean, for me, the reason why I was, you know, I mean, so excited to speak to you for so many reasons, but it's also because it's been such a very personal journey for me in reconnecting to my body and just the peace and the healing that has happened through that part has been, it's almost overwhelming and I'm still integrating so much of it. Um, I went on an embodiment training, like as a coach, I did a five-day embodiment training, but most of what happened there was really stuff for me personally so that I could, yeah, be in my body as a coach while I'm with someone else. And that I realized how difficult that is because also our bodies are always um, like responding to the other body in front of us. And I didn't realize how much of a like, I guess, empath I am and that might sound like a good thing but sometimes it's not because I realize like I've got my body has been totally swept up in their story mm. or the story that their body's telling yeah. and that then I'm not being the best coach that I can be because there's something where I need to also be aware of myself so there's so I mean there's so many intricacies to it how do you find that Erica as 
um someone who's like been practicing this for so long this is a little bit of a selfish question but I'm like is there hope that it gets easier <laughs> to stay grounded in yourself while you're looking at someone else's embodiment yeah um I mean for me it's limiting how how often I do it you know mm. that uh I, I guess I always recognized early on that you know it's it's kind of framed as um your I don't know uh population of choice or your um I can't really not framework you know when people say like uh what kind of work do you do or what do you prefer um I always had a sense that group work was not for me but not that there's a ton of dance therapy out there but for so long most dance therapy was group work mm, um, interesting and not to say that there weren't private practitioners, but it's almost like you start with group and then you become a private practitioner. Um, the field of psychology in general is shifting. So many people just, once they're licensed, go pretty much right into private practice. So, you know, with within reason and obviously licensure and, and stati uh, not statistics, statistics um, you know, requirements, guidelines and all that stuff. But to get my feet wet, you know, I, I really... I had to end up doing a lot of group work and that was very overwhelming for me because one, sometimes it was populations I wasn't um, apt to work with or certainly not comfortable with, which is okay. Like we need to go out of our comfort zone. Yeah. I get that. I get that. Mm -hmm. But um, it wasn't, I, you know, it was quickly like, wow, this isn't just a learning curve. There is something fundamentally in me that is not really going to allow me to connect in the best way I know how with this certain group or, uh, again, population. So I think early on, I recognized that like group work wasn't going to really be a great way for me to connect because it was very difficult for me to connect to all those people. And that that comes down to actually, again, how our bodies are wired. Um, it was very, it, it was much more conducive for me to, even in a group, I ended up what's called like kind of spoking, like spoking out to each person, almost treating like the group as a, coll as collective and, you know, as, as, as a bunch of individuals. Yeah. Um, and so as I have worked and then because of COVID naturally groups have kind of diminished in my life and one-on-one -on -one is really all I do and, and where I thrive. Um, but then within one-on-one -on -one work, you know, at least in the United States, states it's very much like you know do as many sessions as you can work as much as you can there are therapists that are working 80 hours a week which is just there's no way there's no way I could do it but I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's no way that somebody can be with themselves and do that much work with other people I yeah. think then it becomes a mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what I hear you saying is how'd that make you feel how'd that make you feel like how many times can you ask how does that make you feel <laughs> right yeah. it's like yeah I you know and then are we even hearing what they're saying or are we just looking at the clock waiting for the next person you know so even in my one-on-one -on -one work I've recognized that I have to limit how many sessions I do a day and that for a while I felt like I wasn't doing enough you know and it's like well you're you're only seeing four people a day like you need to be seeing eight you know and then I thought well who came up with that <laughs> you know like yeah maybe I just need to find other ways to supplement my work because if I want to do the work that I know I can do and be really present to my clients four is like my max it's just and then it just depends on the work I'm doing you know if it's if I'm seeing four people in a day that are really owning their stuff and very willing to move and in their body it makes it much easier for me you know, and then it does kind of become the, the, the um, equivalent of how did that make you feel? <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, um, you know, if I'm seeing maybe three pretty intense situations, right, intense clients where I know I'm going to have to be doing a lot of the work to be in the body and to get the body um aware of what's happening. It could be a lot of nervous system regulation. It's very taxing for both of us. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's really setting firm boundaries around how many people I can see at one time and then how many sessions I have within a day or even within a week. Yeah. Um, and I know when I'm getting to the point of like, I need more, 
like I can handle more Mm -hmm. that that's coming from a grounded place of you're ready for more, not a mind place that says you're not doing enough. Yeah. That's so powerful. Even just that, if people take away anything, even just the question of like, how can I, like, what is my window of where I'm really present, really doing like my best work? And then where is it where I'm pushing and I'm doing still good work, but it's somewhat diminished by the fact that I think I have to do more hours. And I mean, this is as much for dance teachers as probably anyone else, yeah. <laughs> which is, yeah, how to supplement, how to find ways of working around it, how to make sure that, I mean, this is what I coach dance teachers on because ultimately it's the thing that you love doing. So you don't want to burn yourself out to a place where then either you're showing up, like you said, and just like putting the music on, <laughs> or you gave the example of the just being like, yeah, yeah, okay, and how did you feel? But just putting the music <laughs> right. on and like showing the sets is kind of the equivalent. Um, or to the point where your health starts to suffer. And so I really like I I had this a very similar experience last year because I really slowed right down. I almost mm. slowed down to a complete halt. And I was like, what am I doing? This is so terrible. People are gonna think I'm like the laziest person in the world. But I really had to get that quiet and that slow to build it back up again like I actually couldn't find that place until I'd swung underneath the line (laughs) and then I built it back up again because ultimately I realized that if I want to be coaching in an embodied way and and in integrity I need to know that anything that I'm encouraging them to do I'm already doing it so I better not be working like ridiculous amounts if I'm telling them to slow down too right Right. and that's I think one of the hmm. One of the predicaments, we'll say, right, of the technology business world we live in now, right, where I, I, I mean, I know that a lot of people are 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 doing like exactly what you're saying, right, like really practicing their own embodiment or their own spiritual practice while they're imparting, you know, wisdom to others. But there's so many people that that aren't, right? There's a little bit of hypocrisy where it's like slow down, you know, pay attention to your body. Meanwhile, they're in this hustle culture, you know, where it's like, go, 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 do, do, do. They burn out and then they take these, you know, like retreat vacations somewhere to get back in touch with themselves. It's just like, it's kind of, I notice when I'm like a social media, if I see that or I'm scrolling and I'm like, oh, it's, I just, I feel it in my body. I'm like exhausted. Just, just witnessing that, you know, and some people can do it and be fine, you know? So that's not, not to generalize and say everybody that does that is, is hypocritical, but I noticed for me, I had to do that too. And with COVID, it was, um, a way to do that, a way to kind of like put the microscope and be like, Oh, this is actually how I want to operate. It's been hard. I think as things were or are opening or kind of moving forward to move beyond that. Sometimes I've got to like, Oh, do I want to do more? I don't know. And maybe physically or emotionally I could, it's, it's like that motivation piece sometimes is missing. So, you know, I also just wanted to name that like for in the dance world, right. Or let's just say arts in general, that especially if you are in entertainment, right. If you're in performance, the more you perform, the more money you make. Yeah. And that's a really hard thing to say no to. So if you're hired to do a job and that entails doing 16 shows a week, you don't really have the luxury to take a break. You don't have the luxury to not burn out. Um, And that's a system issue, right? That I don't know. I can't, you know, yeah. Shifting things are shifting. That's not my forte, not my expertise to really talk on, but mental health and dance don't know. And performance in general don't always go hand in hand. Right. So I'm speaking from it, from the perspective of a practitioner, right? A private practitioner, someone who really, who makes their own schedule. Um, You know, there's different privileges in that. And um, I understand that that's not going to be everybody's experience, but, but boundary work in general can be something very valuable, right? So that you learn what your own boundaries are, right? Because even if you're hired for 16 performances a week, right? Are you able to notice that by performance 10, if you're not going to be able to make it to 16, that you can proactively look for your understudy, right? Or you can step away, 
potentially for two shows so that you are ready to go for the next because it could be what limits you and actually um prevents you from performing forever right you yeah do something too much you injure yourself and then you're never able to return it just you know we don't know who that's going to happen to it it you know, but sometimes there are signs, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There right? are whispers in the body, always right. there are whispers right. in the body if we take the time to slow down and hear them, but we so right. often don't. And you're so right. It's it's a system issue, but that doesn't mean that the people inside the system are powerless because right. it's like you said, boundary work. Like how much will I accept for this job? Can I ask for more? If they say no, then I can always just take what they're offering anyway. And it, just having the courage to kind of like, try and it's not exactly fight the system but call the system to a higher level of itself while you're inside it um yeah. and so the boundaries work is yeah is like such a an important piece of that that you mentioned and um mm. i i do believe that another slight issue with this is also that the currency i feel <laughs> that dancers and dance teachers work under is a currency of like hard work they think that that is the currency rather than the value that they're bringing. Yeah. And so when you're so attached to how much physical energy have I exerted today, that's how well I know I've done instead yeah. of being like, Hey, the performance, the stuff I'm getting paid for, that's where I can exert my physical energy. And in the rehearsals, I can give enough where I know I'm good. Like I've got this, I'm going to do a really good job, but no more than that. Like you don't need to, over exploit yourself and we, as dancers we're trained to do that in, in mm. many ways <laughs> so yes, yes. There's, there's ways that we are also able to and that's not to take any of the blame off the people who could do a better job at the top to structure it for looking after the health of their dancers but we're not powerless that's the good news <laughs> yeah no that's a really good point yeah that uh because I mean that makes me think of <laughs> um like I get some joy out of feeling sore after I've done a really yeah. hard workout, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I know, oh, I know I did something right. And then the next day, if I've worked out or done something in the next day, I'm like, I'm not sore at all. God, I didn't do enough. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I think you're right. That is so ingrained in so many of us that, I mean, I know that that's not entirely true. I've kind of worked with that paradigm for years now, but that is, that is still a narrative that comes it's up, somewhere, right? Yeah. Of like, yeah. well, tomorrow you do more tomorrow you push harder. Like that's, that's not, this doesn't need to be the standard, but you're right. That yeah. happens where it's like, you know, if I'm not falling on off my feet and exhausted by the end of the day, then I didn't give it my all. Yeah. And maybe it's yeah. the opposite. I'm not falling off my feet. I do have some reserves in me and I did a good job or I can be proud of my performance. Now I know that I'm healthy, right? Like that's a much healthier perspective to come from. Yeah. Absolutely. So something that I've noticed, I noticed before we even spoke, but I'm noticing even more now as I'm speaking to you is um, how courageous you are. And you might not see it in that way because you are you. So you're probably just like, this is just how I am. But, <laughs> but the way that you, but the way that you are able to like articulate and challenge things that especially like the old paradigms maybe, or the the big institutions or just like how traditional academia has worked. But I see that thread now that I'm speaking to you that you're able to stand in your power and call them out. And I don't know mm. that many people, honestly, in the dance. I mean, there are loads of people in the dance world who say this stuff behind closed doors, which is awesome because it's being noticed and it's being said. There's not as many I feel like who is saying it out loud with the credentials that you have so first of all I just want to mm. say thank you so much for doing that and for being that person because I've seen what can sometimes happen once the certificates are here which is like oh okay I better shut up now then and just go <laughs> along with go along with whatever well, these say. I mean I, I appreciate that I, I feel like maybe perhaps with regard to dance I don't have <laughs> I don't feel like I have a lot of skin in that game <laughs> so like Mm. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, maybe I do, but, um, I, yeah, I, I, again, maybe it's just because I'm in it, but it doesn't feel as courageous because I don't, I'm not necessarily feeling like I'm connected to those people that are going to be like, I can't believe you just said that, 
you know, mm. um, I know people that are in those situations and they're in those meetings, right? Like they're with the Joffrey, they're with, you know, the Hubbard streets, they're with the Mark, I don't know, like all, you know, bigger names. Um, they're, they're in LA, you know, with the top producers and the, um, you know, uh, big production companies, like they're actually on set having these conversations about mental health. Um, yeah, I think I, I almost feel like I get to sit back and just be like, this is what I notice. I don't feel like I'm connected to anybody in, necessarily in that regard where they're going to be like, Hey, we're doing everything we can, you know, I can't believe you just threw our company under the bus. <laughs> like mm. I see other people doing that work. Minding the gap is one of the companies that comes to mind, like, um, really paving the way for the work in the dance world. I think for me, I come at it from you know, dancers need mental health and I just want to be able to support mental health. So I feel like I have the backing with some regard to mental health. That's like, yeah, everybody needs mental health, you know? And um, so, so I don't know. I mean, I appreciate I, what you're saying and I'm like, well, I don't know that I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to get any, I mean, not that I know of any phone calls where people are like, I can't believe you said that, or, you know, put your money where your mouth is. I'm always well, like, Hey, if you, if you want mental health support, in a movement capacity, call me. I'm happy to do that work. But uh, yeah. the lobbying, you know, the like nonprofit work, um, I know that people are out there doing it and they yeah. are directly impacted by what they say and they still say it. And I find that very courageous yeah. too. Yeah, it's awesome. To anyone out there having the difficult conversations like with those directors and et cetera, thank you so much. Yeah. I kind of was also meaning like in your, like in the act, in the world of academia which is slightly different but also related to the, da the dance world because you know I I see some of the comments Erica and they're not always like my comments to you which are like you are no. the best this is amazing sometimes right no sometimes people really like, challenge it no this is not right like this is not right. how this psychology thing and so it's, it's it's that because it doesn't I mean I don't know behind closed doors I guess this is my question like does it phase you or are you so grounded oh. in your truth that you're like, do you know what? It doesn't matter. My heart's in the right place. I believe in what I do, that they can have their opinions and I just like yeah. do that gracefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanna be that. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's hard because at, at, like I, I am a recovering people pleaser in many ways. Um, and so one recognizing that like, first of all, social media, most of those comments are one, people I don't know, two, they're they're potsters like they they just want to be you know because it's kind of funny like why would you follow an account that you don't actually believe in <laughs> right so I think sometimes it's just trolling sometimes it's people just making controversy or wanting to prove their point or to feel heard you know to yeah. have a voice and they're like this is how I feel <laughs> my trouble is anytime someone interacts with a post you know specifically like on Instagram I always, I try my best to always like the post to say like, thank you for participating. Yeah. That's, that's my thing. But I get that's confusing for a lot of people. Cause they're like, well, why did you like their post? That's, you know, ridiculous what they just said, or they totally negated your post. Why would you like that? So for me, it's just kind of like, I see you, you know, there's, there's no other way to do that on Instagram other than to not say anything. And then I feel like unless it's, you know, vulgar or something really inappropriate, then so I'm learning, you know, what to interact with and what not to, you know, social media for me is not my livelihood. It really is just a, a platform to kind of, I always think of it as like practice. I practice putting things out on Instagram in particular, kind of see what people think about it. And then sometimes mm. it ends up being something I'm writing about or something that came up in a session. So I kind of remind myself like, what one person is saying doesn't actually trickle down to my practice. And yeah. I don't see myself as uh, like an Instagram therapist. I'm not actually trying to provide any therapy. I just, I want to create that space where we can talk about how movement and mental health intersect. Um, yeah. And I try to make that clear, you know, if somebody wants help or, um, you know, is looking for more than it's like, contact me privately. You know, it's, it's a fine line. It's very difficult, especially because we're seeing so much, so many somatic videos, right? Like try, do this practice. If you want to feel blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much in the, like trying those, those galleries of like, 
here are five ways to do this, right? Or five ways movement affects this. Um, it's a little bit of strategy. You know, it's kind of like playing the game, to stay relevant <laughs> in social media. Yeah, but, but thank you for saying that because sometimes there's this like puritanical, like everything has to be perfect. Everything I post on Instagram has to be perfect and it has to be, you know, I, I don't, don't play games. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I love the approach that you take, which is like, look, viewing at it, viewing it as a, like an exploration. And okay, what's going to happen here mm, yeah. if I, if I post this and taking people's feedback, like testing the temperature almost of like, yeah. <laughs> How are people feeling about this particular topic right now? That's so much smarter than seeing Instagram as like an actual representation of you or your work and that it's real life because it's not, but it's so easy That's to get right. sucked into that trap. I know I have. It is, it is. And, and I, I'm not going to lie, like there's something where you're like, oh, the numbers are going up. This feels so good. You know, there's, yeah. it's validating. Like something about what I'm saying is resonating with a group of people, but um you try to reel it in, you know, and just be like, Hey, just put out things that you really believe. Because again, for me, it's practice. It's like, maybe this will lead to a book. Maybe this will lead to, you know, another opportunity. I mean, look, it brought us together, you know, so it's like a way to, to network also, but it is very interesting. I still have that need. If somebody's like, I totally disagree. I feel like, mm -hmm. I feel that in, in my body, there's like a, a forward, like a, hmm. yep. <laughs> but, and then it's like, oh, I need to, I need to explain myself. Right. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and so also practicing, not doing that, you know, saying it to myself of like, okay, I feel you. I feel that you really want to respond. What's that going to accomplish? You know, they're allowed to have their opinion. It, I forgot now it happened not that long ago. Someone was like, really like coming at me for something. Yeah. I don't even remember now, but, um, I, uh, the, the post itself, like, wasn't, wasn't, controversial um two people got into something I don't know and I just witnessed it you know I was like there's really nothing I can do in this situation again if it gets inappropriate or vulgar or um you know uh like verbally disrespectful I have every right to you know intervene but it was just like oh I can also choose not to respond you know mm. and um I guess on some level I know some people would look at it and think like, you know, it's a numbers game, right? So some people, you know, who have a small following see any larger following and they're like, oh my God, you have so many people. And then there's me who like sees, you know, these other accounts that are just ginormous. I do see everything people post, you know, and I'm at the point yeah. where I still can respond to yeah. everything. And mm -hmm. then I think to myself, well, will it get to the point? When do you get to the point that you just can't keep up with everything? Cause again, it's not my job. You know, I, I can't yeah. be on it all the time type thing. So it's really interesting and in that people are going to take, take things personally. And it's, it's not, <laughs> no, it's really yeah. not. It's not like, I don't like you. So I'm not responding to you at some point. I'm just, I might not even see the comments. Um, yeah. again, that's not the luxury I technically have yet. <laughs> I tend to see everything because the interactions are not, um, you know, not un, un, uh, unmanageable. Yeah. But it's yeah, funny. I just try I... to keep myself grounded and just like really remind myself that it's not real life. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your philosophy on that so much. And I do find it funny about the comments thing. I don't get this as much on Instagram, but on YouTube a lot, I get people commenting thinking that I'm not going to see it. So they'll like, see, see mm. it like she as if I'm not gonna see it and I'm like yeah I still see all the comments guys right. <laughs> I find that really funny yeah because people obviously say things in even a different way if they think that you're not even ever gonna see it but other people will laugh at my expense who are in the comments so yeah it's it's a whole thing but it's not real life like you said yeah um, and I just I go back to the like not everything's meant for everyone you yeah know? Totally. so it's like if something doesn't, re like there's tons of stuff on social media that doesn't resonate with me. I don't comment on it. I just yeah. go on. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, wow, that's an interesting perspective. I really don't mm. agree with that. Or hmm, maybe I do. And then that leads to another post that, you know, of mine, but it's just not in my nature to read something, especially on social media and challenge it in a comment. It's just not, mm. it's not for me. I actually sometimes do do it and I realize that that's also my nature of like I'm very assertive and I can be a little bit um 
yeah, I challenge people. Like I'm a challenger that, that is who I am. And, but I've been asking myself the question, like, okay, Natalie, that's great. But is Instagram really the place to do it? Like, really? Is that actually the most productive use of your time? Again, like for, I mean, it just comes down to individual, right? Like for me, like I'm not, I'm not a challenger. I, I am in some, in some manners, but, uh, Cause people, some people listening would be like, yeah, you are, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not one to, especially like in a comment, like I said, like, I wouldn't sure. necessarily be like, exactly. I don't agree mostly because I just, I'm not a great typer. So I'm like, I don't have the patience to type all of that <laughs> on my phone. <laughs> That's a good thing um, though. It's like a buffer between right. like, is it worth just actually like, typing this out or not? <laughs> you know, that's why most of my, my like, you know, responses are like an emoji or like double hearts or something, because I just, <laughs> it's not that I don't invest in that. It's so much, I guess I could do like a talk to text, but that never works out well. So, so yeah, I mean, teach his own, right. But going back to yeah. movement, it's like, notice like when you respond to things like that, is it a, is it coming from this like grounded, assertive, mm-hmm. like I'm in my power place, mm-hmm. you know, or is it like, I have to prove, you know, yeah. my worth, my value, that I have a voice, right? Cause we do, we all do that stuff too, you know, where it's yeah. like, or that I, you know, sometimes I feel like this person can't get away with this. I must say something, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think so- I, I have much more, I used to do that much more on Facebook and I've learned not to. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I'm in that. No, I'm in the process of just realizing that it's actually not the place. Like it's not productive. That's the place to have like a, an actual conversation, like with another human being that that would be the, the place and time to do it. Not on Instagram particularly. Yeah. Um, so I love the fact that you take Instagram as like this place to explore, but it's also part of your business in terms of networking, things that you said. Obviously, you right. have your your one to one clients and then you also have your book. And I probably missed some stuff, but I want to hear about your book. What is it about? Who's it for? And mm-hmm. what kind of inspired you to do it at this moment? Like, why is it? This is a book that's needed right now. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, to start off, it's uh, body aware. So <laughs> I actually like, I always. I love it. It's I right like now. a little poster <laughs> in the background because I don't have any bookshelves. So, you know, sometimes you'll see like authors, you know, have strategically like yeah. placed their book right here. <laughs> like, I don't have a bookshelf, so I'll just make a giant poster. Um, it's so the subtitle is Rediscover Your Mind Body Connection, Stop Feeling Stuck, and Improve Your Mental Health Through Simple Movement Practices. So, it's really about uncovering what movement is, redefining what movement is, so that we can transform, right? Make changes again, through movement. And, um, you know, it is definitely based in my work as a dance movement therapist really comes from my years of working with individuals who were living with dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, different cognitive impairments. And who's it for? I mean, really, I wrote it for people, for everyday people. It was just another avenue of like, hmm, how do I strategically get dance therapy out into the mainstream? without it shoving it down their throats, (laughs) you know, like it wasn't like body aware, dance movement therapy, the psychotherapy everybody needs, (laughs) you know, it wasn't like, (laughs) it's not in the title, it's not on the jacket anywhere, Um, you know, it's in the first couple of pages and then, you know, strategically like kind of throughout the book, but um, why it ended up happening now, I mean, honestly, it was, I, I started thinking about it probably in like, I don't know, late 2000 teens, like 2016 or 17, I, people were like, oh, you should write a book or that's so interesting. Um, is there a book on that? And so I was just like keeping notes, you know, kept a folder and around 2018, I guess it was, I started working with someone to, well, I was already like starting to write some sample chapters. And then I really sat down and was like, okay, what does this entail? And I wanted to go the traditional route of publishing. So I needed a a proposal. Proposals in themselves are like at least 80 pages. So I was like, all right, well, that's a book to me. I haven't written that much since college. So um, it was like researching that and, and, you know, finding people who I could work with that would help me put together a really solid proposal. And then by, by the time all was said and done. We started putting the proposal out there. I wanted to get representation and find an agent. And um, then 
I, at the time, um, I had my second child and I was like, great, this is out in the world and I will bring him into the world. And then I'll just sit back and wait for the feedback, which I was anticipating a lot of like for this, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of rejection. Right. Well, then COVID happened and I just forgot. I I was just like, this is not going to happen right now. And so that was March about where we, where I am in the States and, um, come Thanksgiving 2020, I was like, Hmm, maybe I should go back to that. You know, I put a lot of time and effort, a little bit of money into this. I want to make sure that this happens. And I went back to a list that I had made of agents I wanted to query and the top of the list I had never reached out to. Uh, Long story short, a few hours later, she responded. We ended up working together. So it was like all timing, I guess. Um, It was something that I, you know, wanted to do well before 2022. I kind of informally made myself like, I want to do this by a certain birthday, but there's really no way to guarantee that. I didn't know one, if it was going to be picked up and two, how long the publishing process would take. But yeah, so I signed with my agent, um, the end of 2020 and then there it's a longer process for them. It was about an 18 month publication, uh, journey. And so then, yeah, they came out this past summer. So, um, I'm not one that was like, I want to be a published author. It wasn't, I I would honestly, like if you had asked me, certainly as a kid, even 10 years ago, I never thought of writing as my forte, but wanting to create more visibility for our field, educate people on dance movement therapy, also make the body and movement more accessible to people was the kind of the guiding light, you know, where I was like, okay, I think this is an avenue where we can make this happen. And so starting to write for publications online. I got my first freelance job as a a writer with Dance Informa magazine. I've been able to contribute to dance magazine or dance media, you know, being being like interviewed or um, asked for my expertise kind of helped put my voice out there. And then at some point I was like, I think I have it in me to write. And if someone's willing to publish it, (laughs) um, I'd like to see that come to fruition. So I'm so thankful to North Atlantic for publishing it. And, uh, you know, it, it it has a ways to go. Like, I know that it could reach a lot of people and it's already helped so many people in the process, but I think it's just a metaphor for, maybe not a metaphor, but it's a, a direct correlation, right? To just how much further we have to go with mainstreaming yeah. this conversation, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the body keeps the score. That's a huge seller yeah. now. And I'm not, <laughs> not suggesting that's going to happen to my book, but that wasn't even accepted when it was first published. It yeah. took years actually. Yeah. And now it's just regularly on these bestseller lists. So it, it just takes time for people to really understand that body and movement is something necessary with regard to mental health and psychotherapy. So we'll see. I mean, it'll be there forever now, you know, and I hope that people pick it up and, and, um, find value in it when they do. Um, but it's something I'll have forever, something that I can, you know, use as a, uh, like a little bit of a platform, but it's also just like everything I really believe kind of put into, you know, succinctly into one book. So, yeah. I love that. And I love that it wasn't actually your dream to become a published author, like from very young, because that kind of gives me hope as well. Because every now and again, someone, someone actually commented on my YouTube video the other day, and my podcast is called The Rhythmic Body. And they were like, when's the Rhythmic Body book out? And I'm like, I haven't even written a book. Yeah, like, what are you right. talking about? But well, it's hard too, because it's hard together. because I think what people are seeing, and I mean, this is not really on par with our conversation necessarily, but it's like, these big, and and I'm not one of them, but, but we're seeing these big platforms, right? These big social media accounts and influencers, they're basically being poached by publishers to Mm. write books, right? Mm. Or agents are finding them and saying, Hey, you need to write a book, right? Which makes sense. Cause it's like instant New York times bestsellers. (laughs) And not to say that like they have, a lot of them have value, right? Like yeah. there's a reason they have big platforms because what they yeah. say that, you know, a lot of these people have, have amazing things to say. It resonates. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Yeah. So I think we're starting to yeah. see like, oh, if I'm an influencer, then I must have a book, you know, and what mm. will I write about? And mm. I guess just letting people, even though, even though I did write a book, like that's not everybody's process and it actually yeah. has nothing to do with Instagram. 
to be honest, the reason that I'm so invested in Instagram is because of the aftermath of the book. Like publishing, oh, it's just okay. mm-hmm. platform is everything. And um, it's unfortunate in that respect, I think, because I don't think you have to have a social media presence to put good content like yeah, in a book. Yeah, of course not, yeah. But mm-hmm. for anybody listening that's like, I want to write a book. If you're looking to do it a traditional way, there is a huge component of having a large platform, which I'm, again, not there in their terms, but uh, it's, it's kind of, again, it's a little bit of a game to play. So it's interesting. Yeah, but it's so, it's so good that you call it a game to play because this is, I talk to my dance teachers about this all the time because, you know, I, I think a lot of us are really kind of almost against marketing as if marketing is something unethical or something like that. But yeah. actually there are certain games that we play like the same as I don't necessarily mm-hmm. think that every single thing that I learned in school is necessary but you play the game of school and you right. can play the game of social media and you just remember this is not real life um yeah. so and you just find um, your way to put your voice out there like certain yeah you know like I'm again I worked with a publisher that like that wasn't their game you know they were like yeah. we want to put good content out there we want to focus on somatics and body and movement and I was like great yay yeah yeah I love that I have two final questions the first one is can we get a little bit practical for the dance teachers who may be listening who are like oh I don't even think about like how I'm being in my body (laughs) when I'm teaching my class or for the dancers like what is just the most basic kind of in to the body and I'm sure there are lots but any that are kind of coming to your mind right now that you could share yeah, well, I mean, something I uh, I share in the book and I've been sharing like actually on a lot of different uh, platforms um, isn't necessarily even like body focused. I mean, it is, but it's not necessarily this big drawn out like this is the practice that you need to do. Um, it's called acing your mental health. And so A is awareness. Sadly, like that that is what it comes down maybe not sadly but ironically that is what it comes down to and if you're finding that you are not aware then it's up to you to make opportunities to become aware and that might be setting a reminder on your phone writing it down on a post-it in front of the mirror so that as you're teaching you see the reminder that you need to be paying attention to what is happening in your body how your body is showing up so if you feel like you're someone that's easily overwhelmed I tell people like the next time you're feeling overwhelmed Take a time out and notice where it is. Where is your overwhelm in your body, right? Mm. As you're teaching, can you set reminders or pay attention to just notice how am I standing right now? How am I lecturing? How am I relating to my students? The C is to challenge or be curious about the way our bodies are moving. Um, you know, show up in a different way, shift your posture, change your direction. And then the E is expand, you know, or express. So find a way to move through that posture, find a way to elongate, to release, um, again, expansion. You know, maybe that's actually dancing with your students instead of being at the front of the room lecturing, right? Um, So ACE, I think that's something that sticks with me. I do it very regularly. I teach it, I taught it to my kids. Um, I, yeah, talk about it. I feel like any chance I get because it's such an easy acronym. And it takes the pressure off of having to move in any certain way and just focuses on what's happening in at the moment. How are we already moving? Mm, yeah, I love that. So awareness, change, challenge, no, challenge, change, challenge or yeah. change, and then expand mm-hmm. or express. Okay, I love that. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay, so my final question, because you you mentioned your kids there. And this is just a a purely like random question, not related to dance therapy necessarily, but how has like your journey of being a mother either like deepened your own (laughs) connection to your body and or how do you like help them to connect to their bodies? Like I find it so fascinating because it was something that I wasn't taught as a kid. Like, you know, we don't talk about the body, you just have it and you just go along and do whatever you're doing. (laughs) Right, right. Um, okay. Well, how can I answer these, uh, (laughs) succinctly? Let's see. Um, okay. So being a mom has not, well, one actually like going through the process, I had them both, um, 
I mean, I had an epidural, but like natural childbirth, mm-hmm. I guess, mm-hmm. in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I really tried hard to be aware of what I was feeling internally, right? So whether it's like fetal movements or, um, you know, not necessarily aesthetically, but but just physically, right? Like exhaustion, fatigue, nausea, right? Like what are the, the internal like interoceptive things that I'm starting to feel the sensations? So that was helpful. That actually kept me connected to my body. Yeah. Um, I kept moving. I kept dancing for as long as I could. Um, you know, the hard part, like connecting my emotions to my body was a challenge because of like hormones, but it was actually the one thing I really needed. Like Mm. I was so overwhelmed and stressed in many ways, but oddly enough with my second child, I wasn't, but then COVID happened. So I was like thrown into this traumatic, like, you know, just, yeah. Hey, I was doing so well. What happened? Um, so, you know, my own practice being with my own therapist, like talking through things, feeling things was really, really necessary. And I think for my kids, my, my, my younger ones just almost three. So for him, it's, it's more modeling, you know, mm-hmm. but for my older yeah. child, um, she's almost nine. I really noticed like when she, she would get anxious, you know, or nervous, which I didn't, I wasn't surprised because I was an anxious child too. Um, it was enforcing those, those practices, right? I was mm. like, here's some things we can do to, to release the anxiety, right? We're not just going to talk about it, but can you show me what it feels like, you know, without being a therapist, but just ut- utilizing some of these things to empower her to manage yeah. her own overwhelm you know and then she would ask like I need I need some fresh air I'm gonna go outside okay great you know and yeah. it wasn't like I necessarily had to do it I just kind of provided some of the you know modeling like the intervention also owning my own stuff you know I, I yeah. get triggered by things and I can't always prevent it right? I really can't always like catch it in the moment but afterwards I can go back and I can say you know what I noticed that I felt really overwhelmed and you know, I'm going to try really hard to, you know, say that differently, you know, or to take a step back, um, you know, and show that I'm responsible for how I act and that it's not their fault, you know? So it has helped me immensely be a, a parent in general. I hope that it helps me actually be a better parent, (laughs) but, um, that awareness piece is so key, right? Because otherwise I I don't want to be the parent that's like constantly lashing out or yelling because, I'm overwhelmed, right? And I don't know how to manage that. So if I can pay attention to my body and notice how it's showing up, it gives me opportunities to release it, you know, and to support it throughout the day. Yeah. Lucky children. <laughs> have uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm the lucky one. They're so, they're so <laughs> awesome, but, uh, but it's challenging, you know, like so. just like writing a book. I didn't wake up. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't grow up thinking like I was meant to be a mom. Like I just mm-hmm. felt like if it it was meant to be, it was meant to Mm -hmm. be, you know? And so it's been a huge learning process. I'm not a regret in any way, shape or form, but I learned so much more from them. I think that they learned from me. So that's amazing. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Erica, thank you so much. And thank you for indulging me in some questions a little bit outside of the normal. (laughs) Oh, sure. (laughs) That's fun. Um, So People will be wanting to know your Instagram because we talked about it so much. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just the therapist who moves you. So perfect. I will have that linked, um, and also link for the book and link to your website. So okay. everyone, that'll be in the description box. Um, and come and say hi to me and Eric on Instagram if you've enjoyed this. And thank you so much, Erica. Did it, did we miss anything? I feel like we covered a lot there. <laughs> yeah, no, we covered that like more so people are going to get a little bit of everything They're like I didn't really care to hear about publishing but there you go <laughs> <laughs> An right so, thank you so much Erica thanks for watching everyone see you in my next video bye